Well, Rovers, it's time now to start building the Wave Rover 650 bilge keels. Now, a lot of thought and effort went into this. I didn't do it all by myself, not by a long shot. Let's break it down and see how the whole thing came about. My name's Alan Mulholland. I'm a solo sailor. And this is the story of how I built my Wave Rover 650. Three years ago, I refitted a 40-year-old Contessa 26 and took her on an amazing 7,800 nautical mile ocean voyage. We crossed the Atlantic twice, but a knockdown on the second crossing and COVID-19 put an end to my solo circumnavigation. So now, I'm building a new boat, smaller, lighter, but more suited for a solo circumnavigation. The Wave Rover 650. I'm here with my friend Brian Smythe. So this is Brian Smythe. Now, Brian and I were officers, young officers back in the Navy many, many years ago. Back then, he was just Brian, but now he's Dr. Brian Smythe, professor of engineering at the University of Prince Edward Island, and he's taken an interest in our project. And Brian, can you show me what we're working on here? So basically, when I took a look at the keels, the way they were designed, uh, given my industrial background. I've built bilge keels before for larger boats and the way that the keels were designed to me seemed very labor intensive. Uh, having to sheathe them in fiberglass and cover the lead. Whereas if you want to take a look at the screen here I can show you how we used to build bilge keels. So here this is a, a 3D model of the bilge keel. Uh, it's exactly the same dimensions uh, fore and aft and top to bottom as the bilge keels d designed uh, by the original designer. Um, so the lateral plane of resistance will be exactly the same. And I can show you, I'm just trying to go slowly here, how this is built. So this is built out of steel. Uh, the top plate here is e exactly the same as the one that, that would be on the boat uh, with the other bilge keels, but that's where it starts to differ. So let me just click on some of the components. I'm going to open it up so we can see what's on the inside. So I go over here and I hide that feature. And now you can see what's inside this. So there's a central frame here uh, that connects the top and the bottom. And it also forms the backbone for the plating that we're going to wrap around the uh, foil sections. So this uses a, a NACA 0012 airfoil section and you can see in the gray here this is the airfoil section. This airfoil section is a typical section used in keels and rudders on boats so we know that it's appropriate for this application. So all I really did is took that in and this is a separate piece. So basically every piece that you see here uh, that is a different color is actually a different piece of metal. So we have the, the top plate that is going to be bolted onto the hull, uh, just like the original one. And then there's the top foil section here that will be welded to the top plate to provide a template to wrap the sides around, okay? Everything is keyed together. Like you can see that this piece of plate here is keyed through the top plate and through the top foil section right here. You can see it keyed through. You see how it's cut in there? So when you assemble this, it really helps your assembly process because everything is made to fit together. Just like on the sides of, of the uh, rib here, you can see that there's tabs. You see these tabs? And these tabs fit through holes on the plating. Let me go around the other side of the plate. And you can see that we cut the plate with these slots in it. They're alignment slots. So the, uh, the, the idea is that when you put this together, everything fits. It's all designed to fit. 
So just uh, just maybe back up a second and explain how how was it cut? So at the university, uh, they graciously offered the services of the water jet cutter. So a water jet is a very high pressure, exactly what it says, water jet that uh, they inject sand into. The machine does this. So it's squirting a, a really high pressure, high velocity jet of sand filled water. And it can actually cut through about six inches of steel. In our case, uh, it didn't have to cut that much. <laughs> so is it, uh, it, it's very precise, I take it? Yes, it, uh, it would be as accurate as a 3D printer because it uses essentially the same motors, uh, servo motors, to move it around. So about 40 thou uh, would be the accuracy of it. Now, when you're cutting a thicker piece of metal, like if you want to look at uh, the base here, this bottom foil section is actually three quarters of an inch thick. Uh, and when, when we cut this yellow piece, there'll be a slight taper to the jet, right? But it's, it's very slight and it's well within the, uh, the bounds of welding accuracy. So now that uh, this entire plan or, or kit has been put into the software and we can model it like this, can I transport this file now, say, to Helsinki or Sydney, Australia? Yeah, absolutely. So what we do is in, in the 3D model, uh, we have the side plates, the, these green side plates. And there's a feature within, I'm just going to turn it on here if I can find it. Where did it go to? There's a feature within here to flatten that surface, right? So I think this might be it. Let's turn it on. Yeah, so I can take this side shell and then flatten it out. You can see this blue part right. is flat. So if we take a look at the shape of the blue part, you can see that the top is curved, right. the bottom is curved, so that it, it will wrap properly around the foil. Right. So all I do then is I right click on here and I say create, export a DXF file. So a DXF file is a very well known standard drawing file. And if I do that, well, I'm gonna go to, I'll show you the files here. So under Wave Rover, uh, Final Parts DXF, I, I can see that I have each one of these pieces as a DXF file, but like if I show you the bottom foil section, for example, as soon as it wants to open, it just creates a standard two-dimensional DXF file that we can uh, download to, to somebody that wants to purchase a kit. Let me see if I can zoom out. Let's get rid of that. No view. I don't use this program that much because it's old. But you can see basically, how can I pan down? There we go. So here is the DXF file. That's it. It's just, uh, it's a spline with a couple lines on it. Right. And this file can go to any CNC computer numeric controlled machine. Right. Right. So if you have access to a router or a plasma cutter, you can also cut steel with a plasma cutter or a water jet like we did. You send this file to it, you hit go and it cuts that part out. But there's also a possibility if you didn't have any of that, you just wanted to cut it with a torch <laughs> or a grinder, you could make a paper template based yes, on you this. Can take, I could take this file to a, a large format print shop and they could print this out on paper and then I can take that paper template and put it over the steel and cut it out myself with either a handheld plasma cutter or with a just a zip cut yeah you can do that right the hard part would be cutting this inner little part here getting those corners square. right yeah but you could always file that if you had the time right <laughs> But obviously the best way would be to uh, get a plasma cutter or a yeah. CNC plasma cutter or, or a water jet. And how available are those tools in most cities? They're pretty much anywhere. Um, people don't realize it, but uh, there's a lot of CNC operated plasma cutters around. I, I know a guy who has one in his garage here. You could also cut this with a handheld plasma cutter. 
Right. Because it's only, the maximum thickness is three quarters. And you can go to many uh, tool stores and, and you can buy plasma cutters that will cut three quarter inch steel right. for, you know, under $500. But your typical machine shop, that they professional that. Yeah. machine shop would have this. And... The other place that has CNC machines is sign shops because they, they make signs and they cut plastic and stuff like that. Right. So, you know, they may be able to cut it. Right. I know they cut a lot of wood. Yeah. You know, maybe they yeah. can do it for you. Well, I, you know, I haven't been in a, <laughs> even a small town that hasn't had a machine shop of some kind, so... Well, that's fantastic. What do you say we head out to the shop and uh, take a look on. at the real thing? <laughs> Crack on. Yeah. Well, perfect. Sure. Well, after purchasing some steel, then it's a matter of just getting it to the University of Prince Edward Island's engineering technical lab. Now, Brian is a faculty member there, and he was able to make those arrangements for me. It takes just a few moments to do the initial setup on the computer and calibrate the machine. So what's the name of the program we're using here, Brian? Jeff. Uh, Jeff? <laughs> Corio Build from, All right. from Multicam. Well, let the cutting begin. <laughs> That'll be good. I'd like to take a moment to honor the Wave Rover benefactors. So what is a benefactor? Well, these folks have made a contribution of $100 US or more to the project. And their names will be affixed to a bulkhead inside Wave Rover and will be traveling with me on our circumnavigation. Now, these donations truly are much appreciated. Well, after the cutting is complete, and it really didn't take that long, the pieces are loaded into the back of Brian's truck, and from there we're going to transport them to his shop where we'll fabricate the keels. But that's another story. Well, the Wave Rover patrons, with their pledges of support, really do make the creation of these videos possible. Now, if you'd like to know more about Wave Rover's patron page and Benefactor's Bulkhead, I have links to both those pages in the video description. Now, another way to help Wave Rover, and it doesn't cost you a dime, is by sharing our content on your social media. So now, as always, Rovers, thanks for watching. Give us one more. Brilliant.